Eva and Cheryl. Uh, uh, so um, I'll just read your bio. So Dr. Gleb is an internationally renowned thought leader in future proofing and cognitive bias risk management. He serves as the CEO of the boutique future proofing consultancy, Disaster Avoidance Experts, which specialize in helping forward-looking leaders avoid dangerous threats and missed opportunities. He is a neuroscientist, a behavioral econ economist who consults, coaches, and trains leaders on disaster avoidance, risk management, strategic planning, truth-seeking, and decision-making. A best-selling author of several books, Dr. Gleb is well-known among business leaders for his national bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Gleb. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate the kind introduction. Appreciate you inviting me. If everyone would be kind enough to mute your microphones so that background noise uh, doesn't interfere with everyone's experience, that would be great. And we'll unmute them later, closer to the questions and answer. All right. So let's talk about how you as EO members can make the most successful COVID strategic pivots. I'm glad that Hiba uh, already read the white paper and will be curious to see how she relates this presentation to the white paper. And we'll talk about it, of course, in more detail at the Q&A, your experience and so on. But let's talk about first how people adapted global, how people adapted in the beginning, the kind of decision-making that happened early onward. So let's talk about Elon Musk. When we talk about entrepreneurs, you know, EO folks, a lot of EO folks follow Elon Musk closely. He is probably the most famous entrepreneur in the world by now, the most prominent one. How did he respond to the COVID pandemic? Well, he tweeted on March 6, 2020, that the coronavirus panic is dumb. And of course, with his following, that got a great deal of likes. And then shortly afterward, based on current trends, probably close to new, zero new cases in the US by the end of April, 2020. And of course, that was on March 19th that we did not have zero cases. We have by now over 9 million cases. So clearly he made some bad mistakes in his predictions. A very entrepreneurial person, very oriented, very good business leader, but he made serious errors around COVID-19. Now that's kind of new money, very entrepreneurial. What about, let's go to the opposite end and look at old money. Look at people who are you know, perhaps not as entrepreneurial. Goldman Sachs, you know, hard to get more old money than Goldman Sachs. How did Goldman Sachs respond to COVID-19? Well, let's look at their predictions. So what they do is of course manage the money of their clients and manage investments. And they make regular predictions on what's going on in the finances in the market. So let's see what kind of things they predicted around COVID-19 and what will happen there. Goldman Sachs estimated the US GDP growth in the second quarter. So we'll use that, and of course, the second quarter of 2020. So use that as their success or not of their predictions. On February 24th, when COVID-19 was already hitting Italy pretty hard, they said that, well, US GDP growth will be 2.7%. 2.7%, a little bit lower than they anticipated partially because of COVID-19. Then on March 15th, they updated their predictions. So three weeks later, how did the US GDP growth change based on their predictions? 5% decline. So 5% decline from 2.7% growth to 5% decline. That's a 7.7% difference. That's huge. That's incredible. That's a big, big blunder by Goldman Sachs. But what happened only a few days later, on March 20th, they came out with another prediction. And that's after the pandemic was declared national emergency in the US. They said that there will be a 24% decline. So 24% decline, 19% difference from the previous one. And this is obviously, obviously, they screwed up royally. So it's not only entrepreneurs, kind of new money, it's also old money. Lots of companies screwed up. And so as a result, the, you know, Elon Musk is very prominent, Goldman Sachs is very prominent, and lots of people in between screwed up, and they were unprepared. They underestimated the threat. So large majority of companies, including Yale members that I talked to, underestimated the threat. And so they were caught unprepared by the pandemic, and they turned to their emergency business continuity plans. That's what they did, despite these plans not being a good fit for the situation. Now we'll talk about why they're not a good fit, but before that, I'm curious about your experience. In March, 2020, how accurately did all of you 
underestimate the eventual impact of the pandemic. Underestimated it, got it spot on, or overestimated it. Please vote. You'll be able to vote in your Zoom window. Go ahead. See two people voted. Great one. All right. So we see that everyone here underestimated the pandemic, its impact, its power. So yes. So it's a tendency that you know everyone <laughs> shares that that was a big, big problem of not of dissipating the consequences of the pandemic and not making things, revising things to address it in, in a timely manner. All right. So why have business continuity plans so bad? I mean, I'm someone who, as a disaster avoidance expert, so I do future proofing consulting all the time for EO members, entrepreneurs, other companies, larger companies. And so I do business continuity plans regularly. This is a standard feature of future proofing, making sure that you're protected against risks in the future, preventing yourself from being threatened by dangerous risks and preventing yourself from missing golden opportunities. So both of those are features of future proofing. But business continuity plans, the typical ones that are done, they're not a good fit for COVID-19. They're great for an emergency, for a major disruptor, like a hurricane in Florida. That's a huge major disruptor. It's a one to two week disruption in your business. That's something that a business continuity plan, a typical one, is good for. That's not the case with COVID. COVID is not an emergency. Unfortunately, it is not an emergency. Our mindsets are to think of COVID as an emergency. That's what the behavioral science, cognitive neuroscience says, but that's not what it is. It's a disruptor. It's a major disruptor. It's a huge disruptor. The slow moving, high impact, long term disruptor. And you know, right now we're getting vaccines and all that, but the changes that are that the COVID will still be recovering from it for a very long time because some people are vaccine hesitant. Some vaccines might not, not work very effectively against the new strains. There'll still be a long period of just going out from getting the pandemic under control. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And you need to make a serious pivot to survive and thrive in the new world. A serious pivot. A large majority of EO companies need to make a serious pivot. And I hear Niba has companies have been doing that. So we'll talk about that. And you want to think that, understand that this is not simply for the period of recovering from the pandemic, of the period, you know, the next few months until we have everyone who wants a COVID vaccine having one, and then slowly drop or dropping of restrictions and so on. This is not simply these next few months. Absolutely not. The world will change forever. The world will change forever. When these waves of restrictions that we've had, you know, being indoors and all of that, working from inside, the fears, the anxieties, they'll change people's habits, values, desires, behaviors, norms. We'll never go back to that pre-pandemic age of January 2020. And that means that a lot of tendencies that the pandemic has brought into place will continue onward. That will continue onward. So the key to effective Pivoting is to be realistic, not optimistic. Be realistic, not optimistic. You know, you want to think about, realize that too many companies think that things will go back to normal in a few months after enough people have the COVID shots and so on. Unfortunately, this hope <laughs> is not a good strategy. That's a great quote attributed to Vince Lombardi. So hope is not a strategy. You want to plan for the best. You want to hope for the best, but you want to plan for the worst. And the worst is that a lot of the tendencies from COVID will continue. It might not be the worst, but you need to be realistic about it. So for example, working from home, there are many, many surveys that indicate that employees like working from home. Now they might feel some burnout. They might feel some frustration, some fatigue, work-life boundaries, but they also like working from home. So when you do surveys of employees, we can talk about that in the Q&A. You'll see that the majority, over half, do not want to go back to the office more than half the time. We'll, we see something like maybe 10 to 15% want to go back full time to the office. Then maybe something like 20 to 15% want to go back most of the time to the office. Then something like 30 to 40% want to be in the office less than half the week. 
And then something like 15 to 20% want to be fully virtual. That's a big, big change from before when only a tiny, tiny proportion wanted to be fully virtual and most by far wanted to be in the office of full time. So that's an employees, but for employers, there's similar tendencies. You'll see a lot of employers changing their practices to not have a simply office-based culture. And that means that, you know, we're not simply talking about entrepreneurial companies like Dropbox or Twitter or Square. We're talking about major, major old style companies like Nationwide Insurance here in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm based. It's having a lot of its employees move permanently to working from home. This is a big, big tendency. It will definitely continue. Employers like the fact that they don't have to pay as much for commercial real estate, they shrink their footprint. And they also get more productivity. When you look at the statistics and productivity, employees work actually more from home. They're more productive because they don't have a commute. They don't have other kind of hassles of switching costs of getting to work. There's a lot of benefits. There's harms as well in terms of burnout, work-life boundaries. We can talk about that. But that's definitely a tendency that will keep going and increasing in the future. That, that's bad news for commercial real estate, for a lot of office-based services, for a lot of office-based products, a good news for private real estate, for at-home-based services and products. A lot of other tendencies, we're seeing this happen. So people like virtual entertainment and their habits changed a lot and they will not go back to movies, theaters and you know, bowling and so on to nearly as much of an extent, you know, they won't go back to the previous past. I won't, I would be surprised if we have more than 80% of the previous revenue from movie theaters, for example, or other sort of entertainment, in-person entertainment values. That's a huge hit. 35% of the population reports that they liked picking up new cooking habits during the pandemic and they plan to continue them afterwards. That's bad news for restaurants. You know, many people will never will not be going back to restaurants nearly as often. And that's bad news. And that's something that we need to be thinking about and understanding. You need to be thinking about, well, regardless, regarding where your business is positioned in this and where your clients, where the businesses that you do business with that are positioned, whether where your vendors are positioned. So your business context, you need to be thinking about that as part of the pivot. So you need to be reassessing your assumptions, reassessing your assumptions. Think about the challenges you had recently. Forecast the trends broadly and in your sector for threats and for opportunities. How would you adapt to a pessimistic outcome, whatever that means for your sector, whatever that means for your company? And how would you revise your strategy and operations for a pessimistic outcome? That's something you really have to be thinking about. So I want to take a couple of more polls right now. One is how much do you think you might need to change your business model to have the best fit for a post COVID future? Not at all, a tiny tweak, a moderate revision or a substantial reassessment. Which of those characterizes you of the needing to change your business model? So I see two people voted. Let's get another one of the EO members voted. Okay, great. So we see that it's definitely either moderate or, sub or really substantial reassessment. So substantial, really serious shifts moderate, still some pretty serious shifts for everyone here on the meeting. So that's really important for you to understand and know it's not only you, it's also other EO members who need to really be seriously thinking, who are seriously thinking about revising their strategy going forward. Now, let's take a look at reassessing your assumptions. How well do you think you're positioned for a pessimistic scenario? with pessimistic meaning something like the trends that are caused by COVID continue and there's still going to be a long-term recovery period. Are you perfectly positioned, need some improvements or need serious adjustments? So all of you need some improvements. Some improvements, uh, that's gr great for you to understand that you need some, some improvements for that post COVID specific pessimistic scenario, which is, you know, the result, the trends are showing that it's increasingly likely that a lot of the shifts that we saw in COVID will continue afterward. Although we don't know the extent to which they'll continue afterward, but definitely quite a bit. So reassessing assumptions, that's the first step. 
that you will be doing. So here we're talking about what you will be doing. This is guidance for you for making an effective strategic pivot. When you're thinking about, okay, you're in your company, you're a leader, you are trying to get your company to think about the future and to reassess your assumptions to make a pivot, think about those challenges, forecast trends, how would you adapt to a pessimistic outcome and how would you revise your strategy and operations? Those are the questions that you need to ask in reassessing your assumptions as a leadership team. So as a leadership team, those are the questions and you need to give some bullet point answers. Those bullet point answers will then inform how you are thinking about your fundamental business model transformations. Think about this question. I think it's really helpful for fundamental business model transformations, even moderate business model uh, transformations. You want to always be thinking about how can your business model, your new business model, put your current one out of business? That's a very in-depth, insightful question that will get a lot of attention and will get a lot of discussion. How can you create a new business model for your business, whatever you're doing, that will put your current one out of business? If you get that, that, that will get you, you know, a 10x boost in what you're doing. But even you know, putting it mostly out of business, but the, that's the mentality that you want to be thinking. How can your new business model put your current one out of business? What if the future focused much more on virtual interactions, which it clearly seems it is? We don't know how much it is. We don't know if you know 20% of the employees will be working from home all the all the time and you know more than half will actually be work going to the office or if less than half will be going to the office or what the future holds but think about this one think about the variety of scenarios where your focus where the future focused on virtual interactions how can your new business model put your current one out of business what if the trends from the pandemic don't reverse which many of them look like they won't reverse based on what people are sharing about their future preferences, about their current preferences and future preferences, even after the pandemic. So consider those fundamental business model transformations as part of what is informing you going forward. Then gather information. So those are two steps for you to do as a leadership team. Those are leadership team moments where you as a leadership team have these discussions, have those questions, prepare, a written document of your thoughts on these questions. And then you go to your staff. You go to the team, to the people who are working with customers every day, who are working with vendors, all sorts of people who are on your team. And what you do is use this reassessment of assumptions to gather information. Talk to them about, hey, these are the assumptions. Have, talk, have each of your leaders talk to their direct reports to say, hey, here are some of the reassessments we're thinking. What are your perceptions on this? How would this impact your work? How, what do you think is the likelihood of this? How would our customers behave differently? How would our investors behave differently to the extent that you have investors? How would our vendors, of course, behave differently? All of those suppliers, all of those things. So get the information from the grassroots, the rank and file of your organizations. So each company leader, what I encourage you to do is tap direct reports and your own network in the company. So you can have some direct reports, you can have your own network, you know, everyone has a network within the company that they feel will have their ear to the ground. So tap your direct reports and your own network. And then each leader prepares a report on revising strategy and operations for both moderate and especially for pessimistic scenarios. So that's what you want to do. You want each leader, each leader after they did the initial revising of assumptions, go to their direct reports, go to their own network, talk to them about the revisions of these assumptions, and then prepare a report on revising the company's strategy and its operations. So of course, strategy, when I talk about strategy, I talk about the broad direction where your company is going in the next few years. What you want your company to be, this ideal vision of where you see the future positioned. And it should be specific enough that you can inform your decision-making, your broad decision-making, your leaders, leadership structure can make decisions and your staff, your operations staff can make decisions using that broad strategy, that they, that strategy should inform your decision-making. We can talk about what that looks like, but of course, then revising the operations, how would you revise your operations to meet this strategy? So prepare a report on it from each leader based on tapping their network, their direct reports, using the reassessment of assumptions. 
And then you want to have a strategic retreat. This is going to be a leadership strategic retreat where all the reports, all the information gathering, all the challenging of assumptions feed into. So you want to defend your future. This is going to be the technique that you use to make to go for the report. Now, before I go for the report, I'm going to before I go for the technique, I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions on what I've covered so far, because the technique will be somewhat in depth, and I don't want the previous parts to be lost before we go to the technique. At this point, you can unmute yourself, and if you have any questions, please ask your questions. Dr. Kib, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about um, the different amounts of people through surveys of what they plan on doing, what they'd like to do, whether they're looking forward to getting out or whether they want to stay home, was there any kind of survey that was done um, that de determined whether it was uh, people who lived alone or people who lived with, you know, multiple other people in their in their household or their family that seemed to make a difference where the people who lived alone, did they want to continue to be alone or were they the ones that were really looking to get out and mm. say, go to the gym, go to Crunch Fitness mm. um, and out to restaurants or was it just the opposite? Was anything done on that to see? Not um, that I, uh, yeah, I, I hear the question. Not that I recall some differentiation. I mean, they did things by gender, not by whether people lived alone or not. But I suspect that if people lived alone, a number of people lived alone by choice, <laughs> you know. So it's probably, I mean, number of lived alone, they would prefer to not live alone, but a number lived alone by choice. So I think that's probably going to determine a lot of things if they lived alone by choice or if they didn't live, live alone by choice. Other folks, questions? All right, let's go to the technique. So this is the technique I would encourage you to do at the strategic retreat. And this has eight parts, eight steps. You determine the scope and goals, then gather stakeholders. I'll go for each of these in turn. So you determine the scope and goals of what you want to figure out, the strategic pivot. You gather the stakeholders. And by the way, the strategic pivot technique is applicable to any major disruption, of course. It does not have to be COVID. So anything disruptive, if your industry is disrupted, if your region is disrupted, something that is in any sort of major disruption, and that we have plenty of disruptions, 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis, you know, or let's say that tele for the insurance industry, and you know, someone here is in the insurance industry, the climate change, the growing realization of the impact of climate change, that is a disruptor and it shift to, shifts around climate change. So all of these sorts of things, this technique is applicable to. The previous part, reassessing assumptions, thinking about the new business model that will put yours, old ones out of business under moderate and especially pessimistic scenarios, gathering information, then writing up a report that will all feed into a strategic retreat where you do go for this technique of defending your future. You determine the scope and goals, gather the stakeholders, figure out the anticipated future. What does the future look like if everything goes as it currently seems to be going? Then unanticipated problems. What kind of problems and challenges come up can come up with various events, disruptions, problems? Then unanticipated opportunities. This is not only about negative. So you don't only manage when you do future proofing. This is the a quintessential as technique of future proofing, you don't simply look at the risks. You also look at rewards. So you don't simply look at problems and threats. You also look for opportunities. That's so that you look at that, then you look for cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors that cause us to make pretty bad decisions, including the kind of bad decisions that a number of folks made early on in the pandemic. Then you look for unknown unknowns, black swans. We'll talk about that. And finally, you communicate your findings and take the next steps that you determined were the right things to do. So let's go through it one by one. Scope and goals, what does that refer to? So you want to decide on several things as part of the evaluation of the scope and the goals. You want to decide on the area. You don't have to do a strategic pivot for your whole company. I recommend that you do it for the whole company. But if you have a specific subcomponent, let's say you want to look at your marketing, and you're thinking about, okay, you know, my company is doing quite fine, but let's say my client base is, there's gonna be a number of winners and losers, and I can reassess 
my marketing to target more of the ones who I think are winners and not the ones who I think are losers. That's, that's an example of where you can decide on that. Or let's say you have some suppliers and you want to change your logistics chains because of the disruptions recently. And so you can think of, okay, I, everything else is going fine, but I'm gonna focus on my logistics or of course, focus on the whole company. Then the scope, the range of things. So if you're looking at your marketing, you can think about, okay, am I thinking about marketing? Am I also thinking about sales? All of these sorts of things. Am I thinking if, you're, if you do B2B and B2C, you can decide, okay, I'm not going to, my B2C is fine, but my B2B is, needs to be addressed. Then you determine your strategic goals. So I'm gonna assume that you're gonna do a pivot for the whole company, but again, you don't have to. So strategic goals, that is where you want to be in that time period that you're doing a pivot for. So what are your goals? What do you want to accomplish? What, how do you want to identify your company? You'll want to kind of create a narrative, a vision of that company three years in the future, two years in the future, four or five, whatever time scope. So have that vision, write out a narrative for what you want that future to look like for your company. It's really very helpful to have a clear narrative. So a couple of pages that describes your ideal vision of that future, because then you can really direct yourself toward it, make it visceral, make it emotional, make it powerful. And then your timeline. So I recommend timelines from six to 60 months. That depends, so again, half a year to five years. We don't really usually go beyond five years. It's pretty hard to predict that far out. I mean, some things we can predict. We can predict that climate change is going to get worse and Florida will be hit with more hurricanes, right? That's not a hard prediction to make. But the general kind of business relevant predictions, it's for a single company, it's going to be pretty hard to go beyond five years and still have serious, significant, meaningful predictions. The longer the timeline, so if you go, if you decide to do three years versus five years, the less accurate you'll be. On one year, you'll be more accurate than three years. and three years, you'll be more accurate than five years. The less accuracy you, need, you have, the more resources you'll need to address uncertainty. It's a basic fundamental principle of future proofing, of risk management and opportunity management. Because you're more uncertain, you'll have, need more resources to address that uncertainty. So that's the first step, the scope and goals. Then gather the stakeholders. You want to decide who you want to be in the room. And ideally, you don't want more than four to six people. So ideally, you don't want more than six people. The ideal number I've seen when I do these, facilitate these, is four to six people in the room. No more than 10. I, I was recently doing a strategic pivot for a startup, late stage startup with EO involvement. That um, late stage, I mean, they had, it was maybe the F round and they had something like a 1.4 billion valuation, something like 500 employees. And they wanted not simply the leadership team of the six people in the room, but the second leadership, the second tier, which was about 25 more people. That does not work. You want no more than 10 people in the room. So we've actually bargained down to eight, which not, not the best, but you know, <laughs> can make it work. But no more than 10 people. You want a balance of expertise and authority. If you're doing the whole company, then you're just going to have the leadership team. If you're doing a specific area, like let's say marketing, you'll also want some people from grassroots marketing, you know, mid-level managers, if you have the, that level of management or people who are have their ear on the ground, the, the people who are the rank and file, definitely want some of them in the room. So you want expertise, that that's, provides expertise, pulse on the beating heart of the client, right? And authority. You want people with authority in the room, so you want to make sure there are a number of leaders. Consider recruiting an independent facilitator. I found that EO groups really, EO companies can help each other. So you can have a fellow EO member do that or another independent facilitator. If you have a business coach, a consultant, someone like that. So get that independent facilitator. I strongly encourage it because that will help you, the person who is actually Otherwise, the leader who is managing the meeting will not be able to really focus effectively on the content of the meeting because they'll be both having to lead the meeting and then facilitate it. That just that does not work very well. So I encourage you to get somebody from outside the company to be a facilitator. Then the future. What does the future look like if the current trends continue? Look at the current trends, evaluate the current trends. You've already predicted them. 
and you have reports with feedback from rank and file staff on the predictions and what is going on. What does the anticipated future look like if the current trends continue? Then if everything goes as you anticipate, think about how many resources would you require? How many resources would you require over that three-year timeline to achieve the goals that you're seeking to achieve? So think about those resources and think about how you'll acquire, reserve, husband those resources effectively. So make that into an actual dollar number. It doesn't, you know, you don't make that broad and get down all resources that you have to the dollar, to the dollar amount. If you need, let's say something like, oh, I mean, obviously money, time can be converted to money pretty easily. You, know, you can pay somebody to do certain things. Social capital can be converted to money. What is the worth of various, you know, how much does it cost you to establish various connections, various opportunities? So try to convert everything to money as the fundamental resource, because that will help you make better decisions going forward when you have one unit of evaluation. So that's the anticipated future. Now we're going on to unanticipated problems. Unanticipated problems. These are more of the threats that we talked about. I strongly encourage you to have everyone on the team who is doing this write out potential problems anonymously. You can write them out anonymously. There was a time when I did a strategic pivoting retreat where somebody said that the launch of a new product will not work out because the operations, the, the head of operations, you know, hates the gut of the marketing head. And that was big revelation. This was something that, that was going, mean, I didn't know about it. I'm sure everyone in the team knew about it, but they weren't really thinking about it as something of a problem to address. And so once that got out there and once it was the, you know, the elephant in the room was visible, we actually talked about it and we figured out how to make things work despite the personal animosity between those two in such a way that they were both incentivized to collaborate and that there was a mediator between them for this product launch. So right now, you don't, those are not things that would be politically comfortable to say out loud. Comfortable, politically comfortable. So this is something that I strongly encourage you to do. And then the independent facilitator, of course, gathers them and reads them out loud, figure out the likelihood as, as you read them, as the facilitator reads them, you go through the team, you figure out the likelihood and the impact of each. What is the probability that, let's say, the restaurant industry doesn't go back to above 80% of its previous sales? What is the impact of that on your business? So what's the probability, what's the impact? And of course, you have already had the information that you gathered to help you estimate the likelihood and the impact of each. Then determine the most serious problems. What are the most serious problems that can occur? And brainstorm solutions. Here's how you can solve things. You know, If you're looking, if your major client is the restaurant industry, maybe you can shift to a number of other industries where you're gonna be really focusing much more of your marketing and sales. And that's actually what happened to the company for which I was doing the strategic pivot. That's one of the major issues that they decided to do. Then you identify resources that you need to solve these problems. So information, you know, when you're entering a new market, obviously you want strategic information and so on. And of course, money, time, people, all of these sorts of things. And then update your strategic plan with this new information. So you already had some information with anticipated future. Now you want to update your strategic plan with this new information. And again, oh, I should mention this, these problems can be anticipated problems that are internal and external. So if you anticipate that, you know, let's say a problem I've seen often in your e organizations is that there is too much is riding on the founder. And if the founder happens to break a leg or develop a anxiety, you know, nervous breakdown, that is a big, big, serious problem. So you want to address these sorts of things, or let's say collaboration between two partners that two partners fall out. Then unanticipated opportunities. The same thing goes for unanticipated opportunities. You know, a dollar lost you know, and a dollar gained cancel each other out. And a dollar which you did not gain is just as bad as a dollar you lost, right? <laughs> so that you, you, that's just as bad for your balance uh, sheet. So don't do that. Think about the anticipated opportunities, internal and external. Again, you want to write out those potential opportunities anonymously. That's really important and valuable to write them out anonymously. And you estimate the likelihood and the impact of each of these opportunities. So that's, again, using the information you got before. 
determine the most promising ones and brainstorm ideas to bring them about and seize these opportunities. Identify the resources that you'll need to seize these opportunities. And again, update your strategic plan with this new information. So the startup that I was mentioning, they figured out a strategic opportunity where their previous product development, software product, was really focused on bells and whistles and impressing customers with bells and whistles. Well, in the new environment of COVID and financial cuts and so on, the bells and whistles were not as important as they used to be. But they had an opportunity to orient their new product, their product development to gathering data and providing proof of value, which previously their product wasn't doing. It was just focusing on bells and whistles. Now that they figured that out, they're really reinvesting. They shifted their investments as an anticipated opportunity to focusing much more on demonstrating the value of the product to customers by gathering data and integrating the data gathering into the product itself and demonstration of value. So that's a major opportunity that they wouldn't have realized without the strategic pivot. Then think about dangerous judgment errors. So these are cognitive biases that are really problematic. They cause us to make bad decisions like a number of people made on the early part of the pandemic. Check for the relevant ones and use the assessment for dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which I'll send to you after the presentation. I'm not gonna go into it right now because it just would be too long to talk about these dangerous judgment errors, but I'll be happy to talk about them if you have questions. Then unknown unknowns. So this is an important one. You want to think about additional major disruptors. What's going on? You know, some things you can't predict. For example, you know, a, a solar storm that blows out GPS satellites, that if your company is dependent on GPS satellites, which includes having Wi-Fi and work at home, that would be a serious problem that you can't predict. But many other problems, of course, you can predict for many people like Bill Gates were saying all along that the pandemic is coming and you really need to be prepared. And a number of companies bought things like pandemic insurance, which of course is a way that you can protect yourself from the pandemic. So think about for you and your key stakeholders. It doesn't mean only you. That means that your clients, that means that your stake, that the, the vendors and the service providers think about disruptors for them. So for example, right now, the situation with the US and China is getting worse and worse and worse. If you rely on Chinese partners, you know, that might be something to think about you know, where that's going. Decide on the resources you need to address these problems. So whatever resources you need, think about ways of addressing these problems. So think about problem solving, brainstorm solutions, decide on the resources that you'll need. And then add 40% to account for truly unpredictable events like solar storms. You know, that's something that you can't predict, that you can't account for. And when you look at the research on black swans and what Donald Rumsfeld called unknown unknowns, 40% can is a good chunk to put into accounting for truly unpredictable events. So of all unknown unknowns, you when you look at the money, you know, for example, insurance for a certain issue that might come up and you gather those resources, then you add 40% and just have that as a reserve for truly unknown unknowns. And that's, you also want to consider how you can make your plans more flexible and resilient because that will be helpful for all sorts of unknown unknowns being more flexible and resilient. All right, and then communicate and take the next steps. So that is a stage where you figure out, okay, what are the next steps? Communicate the, the new strategic orientation and the operationalization of it to your team. So stakeholders and then reserve the resources that you needed, which you already discussed and figured out throughout this exercise and take the next steps. So you want to assign next steps to specific leaders and hold, make sure they're accountable for them, talk about how they will report on them, how they will address them, what will happen, and we can talk about that in the Q&A. So that's the defend your future technique. And I want to ask you, now that you've taken a look at the defend your future technique, how valuable do you think it would be for you to do a defend your future strategic exercise for your company? Please go ahead and vote. No value, moderate value, or high value. How valuable do you think it would be for you? See, two people voted. Great, so three people voted. 
perfect. So we see that it would be either moderately or highly valuable. So the two of you, it would be high value, that's great. And uh, one of you would be moderate value. So I'll send you a manual on doing this technique. And then you can find, you can bring this information, bring this manual to your team and talk about, okay, you know, I think this is a technique we should do, we should go through it and so on. Great. And finally, the resources I promised to send. So three additional resources, the assessment and dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which will go for the dangerous judgment errors you wanna check for as you go through the defend your future technique. Then the manual on defending your future. So the actual technique itself, what you do that has some case studies of how to apply it. And then the digital version of my bestseller, never go with your gut, how pioneering leaders make the best decisions to avoid business disasters. And finally, there are free open, there's, I have free open slots for first come first serve coaching sessions. Fortunately, there are free people here. So if you want those, you'll be able to grab it. So please respond whether you would like to post training resources. Go ahead, vote. Excellent. All right, great. So I see everyone here wants them. So I'll just send them to everyone from the team. Great, so that's the extent of the presentation and I will be happy to take to take more questions right now on any aspects of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Glab. That was very nice. Um, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur and as somebody who you know, believes in EOS and really just kind of constantly staying above the trend in terms of just reinventing all the time, how does this differentiate from a normal entrepreneur's mindset of kind of constantly reassessing the business? Does it mm -hmm. go hand in hand or is it kind of an exaggeration really. of that? Uh, the constant orientation toward improvement is improvement. So it's improvement. How are you improving your current business model? That's the orientation. That's, the, that's what EOS is about. Look at your current business model, make sure that you're operationalizing it well, make sure you're more efficient, make all of these sorts of things. That's not about how can you put your current business model out of business. <laughs> that is well, a kind of is because we're always constantly, uh, you know, seeing how we can be better. But I agree but, with you. Yeah, I, I yeah. think it goes hand in hand. Yeah. You know, the, the, being better, I mean, the, the EOS is very valuable. The, I'm not saying it's not valuable. It's very, very valuable for improving your business. For improving, you know, that's that five to ten, five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent improvement. That's what EOS is designed for. It's great for that. And it's very valuable to use it for those operational issues. It's not designed for strategic reassessment. It's not designed to say, where are you going to have your business five years in the future? How are you going to change it from where you are right now to having a business model five years in the future that puts your current one out of business? It's, it's, there, that's the difference between pivoting kind of, you know, that's a fundamental strategic pivot. So that okay. is the difference. And it's, again, EOS is valuable and you should be doing it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Others. I don't really have any questions, but I always feel bad when nobody says anything. <laughs> I mean, if people don't have any questions, great. That's clear. Now, but, send you know, all the what resources. you said was very valuable. I mean, I'm a business growth coach. I'm um, scaling up in three hag way. And so I do work with strategy and um, pivots and that kind of thing. And so I wanted to just kind of learn Excellent. outside of my ecosystem, you know, yeah. what other people are thinking and appreciate your um, everything that you presented. So thank you. You're very welcome. I'm glad that it's helpful, Cheryl. Yeah, same here. I feel it was very well formalized. Um, many of the things we've already recognized, um, but I felt this added a layer of complexity to it, which I like. Mm -hmm and a layer of um, process. So yeah. going step by step, anticipating, you know, um, the unknown unknowns. I love that part. So that's something that um, we'll definitely take into account going forward, at least with my marketing and sales strategies. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Great. And also that whole concept of putting yourself out of business because, you know, there are yeah. companies mm -hmm. that say, oh, I don't want to do this because it'll cannibalize myself. And we yeah. always are like, well, you better cannibalize yourself or someone else is going to cannibalize you. <laughs> yep. so. Yeah, that, that's a very good mindset to have, putting yourself out of business in kind of that orientation, that strategic pivoting orientation, because that gives you freedom in the regular 
way that you're thinking about that one is thinking about things in the EOS and so on in the operations. That's not the way to think. It's not the, the way to think is how to make yourself more efficient, how to improve, not how to put yourself out of business. That's a special time when you're doing a strategic pivot to really think how in, in five years can I put myself out of business or in three years. I think one thing that stood out for me as well was, and that's something that we've also recognized is that this is not going away. And whatever we pivoted back in April of 2020, we're still adopting those same strategies. We're still adopting mm -hmm. the same mindset, although we're now, you know, making advancements in vaccines and people are mm -hmm. out more and there was some of the restrictions have been lifted, mask mandates, et cetera. But we we're still in, I don't know what mode I would call it we're still in a very apprehensive state. We're not, sure. we're not back to normal yet. And we no. will be back to normal for at least another couple of months. Oh, um, I think that it will be a long time before people are back to normal, yeah. especially given you know, people have a lot of anxiety if you look at mental health and so on. And the, we'll never go back to January, 2020. That's just a fact, no. you know, our habits, no. norms. So, you know, if we think of no. normal, many, com many companies still think we'll go back to that. If we think of normal as January, 2020, we'll never go back to that. And so for that's sure. why it's very important yeah. to look at these trends. And where yeah, going. for sure. Especially in the gym industry. <laughs> yep. All right, everyone. Well, thank you very much for coming and I will send you those resources pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you very day, much. Everyone. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Bye-bye.